Back in episodes 10 and 11, we took a look at how we could use PowerShell in our Windows domain to extract all of the user information and then correlate that information over to what's happening with our Human Resources Department. In this episode, though, we're going to take PowerShell a step further and see how we can leverage some of the information that we gathered with regard to users and groups in order to even launch an attack against the domain. Now, this episode is a little bit different in that we're not showing a particular audit task. Rather, we're really discussing a security vulnerability that exists because remember that all authenticated users within your domain have the right to extract all of the user IDs from the domain. And this can, of course, lead to very serious problems. So let's take a look at how we can leverage PowerShell. And you may find this demonstration useful in trying to educate other people when it comes to the security of username and passwords for accounts. So as you can see here at my desktop, I'm already logged into my Windows computer, and I'm going to start by creating a, uh, a file here. I'll use Notepad just to create a new file that I'll then open up in the PowerShell editor. We'll call this the, uh, I'll just call it attack.ps1. You may remember from our previous episode that naming something with a .ps1 is make, what makes it a PowerShell script. And personally, I just do it this way so that I can simply right-click and bring it right into the PowerShell editor. Now that the editor is up and running, we can get started right away. And like I said, we're going to leverage some of the things that we already discussed back in episodes 10 and 11. So I will go through some of this kind of quickly. For example, using the dsquery command to extract a list of all of the usernames and remembering to use the dash limit zero so that I actually get all of the accounts. I'm going to redirect that content into a file called users, just so that I can reference that data later. And what I'd like to do is loop through that file, just like we did in the last episode. We're going to use the for each command that you may remember allows us to loop through a series of content. And I'm going to uh, find within this file the fully distinguished names. So I'll name my variable fdn. And I'll just tell the for each to loop through fdn in the get content for the user's file. Now, if you happen to type this script in, rather than just show some of the demonstration, don't forget that when you reference that file, you must use a distinguished path. You cannot just put the file name users, because PowerShell does require full paths or relative paths for everything. So I'll now start a, uh, open a brace, and I'll put in the closing brace too, just so I don't forget. Now. What I'd like to do for each one of those users that we have is I would like to extract out the SAM ID for those accounts. Now we can use the dsget tool to do that by simply specifying that we'd like to get information about a user, provide the fully distinguished name, and then provide the element of the user account that we'd like. In this case, the SAM ID. Now if I run that at a command line, why don't we just do that quick here to com so that we know what's going to happen user followed by a fully distinguished name. Well, why don't we do a DS query user. There's some fully distinguished names. And I'm just going to cheat and copy one of these. I'll simply click and drag. Hit the enter key. And now we'll use the DS get user and we'll just paste in that account name. There it is. And I'll tell it that I'd like the SAM ID. Now, when I get that information back, you'll see that it actually provides three different lines. The first line is Sam ID, the next one is Daryl Packard, and the next one is a message telling me that it succeeded. Well, I'm going to need to retain this information because I need that Sam ID, but it's also very important to note that it comes back in three lines. So here's an easy way we can get at that data. I'm simply going to put it into a variable, I'll call it results. Now the result of that command will get stored into that variable. Next, I'll simply add another line and tell it that I'd like to set this SAM ID to be equal to the results object that's come back, because that's what it actually is. And I'd like it to be the first value, actually the second value, because zero would be the first, one would be the second. So we're taking a look at the second position in that array within the object. And that particular string, you may remember, has some extra spaces around it, especially at the beginning of the line. So I'm also going to tell it to replace all of the spaces with nothing. That'll just streamline it down so it's just the SAM ID that's left. 
The next thing I'd like to do is uh, how about we print the name so that we can see what's going on. So I'll use a write host to do that and I'll simply say what the SAM ID is. This also provides a little troubleshooting so that I know if the script is working or not, but it even provides some feedback while it's running so that I can see if it's gotten hung up for some reason. Next, we want to actually use those usernames to try to do password guessing. Now we're going to use a strategy that I wrote up in a previous blog article some time ago, and I'll actually put a link to that article in the show notes. And the main point of that article is that we spend so much time pr trying to prevent or protect the passwords and very little time looking at the usernames, while the usernames are actually very important, which is what this is demonstrating in this presentation. So what I've done is I've created a small file called password. There it is and it just has three passwords in it. The way I would do this is take a look at the the password policy for the domain and find out how many password attempts a user has before an account is locked. If I found for instance that six login attempts were permitted before a lock then I would just set this so that it would allow for five different passwords. I'm just using three here for the demonstration but those passwords would go into this text file. So let me close that back up and show you what we'll do with that. What I'd like to do is try each one of those passwords with each of the usernames. So I'm going to use another for each and tell it to get the password out of the password.txt file. So that's going to take each password out one at a time. Now I've also found that it's useful to just make sure that that's stripped down so it's just the ASCII password with no special control characters or anything else on it. So I'm simply going to replace password with the value of password that has been run through the replace command, stripping out all of those any extra spaces that could be hanging around. Now that that's done, we're actually ready to try to log in with this account. But how can we do that? That requires some interactivity, doesn't it? Actually, the dsget and dsquery commands provide the perfect opportunity for us to attempt this, and probably does so in a way that you're not accustomed to. Rather than trying to log in, which would create a regular login event, now we're trying to do a directory services query, so the event generated is actually quite different. What we'll do is ask it to do a dsget user for the fully distinguished name, and we'll ask it instead of to instead of using my default credentials I can actually provide credentials right on the command line so I'm going to provide the SAM ID and the password that we used and I'm going to redirect the output of that into dollar null dollar null is actually a special variable that we have in PowerShell that gives you a a place that you can put things that you actually don't want like here I don't want this output coming to the screen but I'm also not going to process it in any way so I'm just going to redirect it into null. Well, if I don't process it, how do I know whether or not I was successful in guessing the username? Well, the answer is that much as we find in all other scripting languages, there is a way to access the last exit code or error code of the last thing that ran. Now these can be defined in different ways. For instance, in batch scripting, we would use the error level in order to uh, to describe that error level, there it is. But in uh, in PowerShell, we actually have something that's pretty familiar to someone who's done scripting in other languages. The dollar sign, of course, represents a variable. The question mark represents the return code. Now, this return code is actually quite simple. You could actually get the uh, the last exit code. The last exit code will be the actual number the dollar sign question mark just returns a true false whether or not the command was successful so why don't we do this how about we say if the last command was successful I'm going to write host account password and that's it well let's see if our script works I'm going to switch over to my command prompt now and I'm just going to run this PowerShell script. Now you'll note of course that I'm already in PowerShell which you do by running the PowerShell command. Again if you run into trouble here you may want to look back at episodes 10 and 11 that talk about setting the execution policy and a few other things that might assist you in getting this running. But let me try to run the attack script and see what happens. Well we can see that it's trying each account name 
and for each one it tries those passwords that we had listed. And nothing so far, but, ah, we've just found John Rakosi's password and also Magda Alem. Now, of course, we could run this through the entire domain. And again, of course, I set those two accounts to have weak passwords. But the point is that if you do some intelligent guessing, the more users you have in your domain, the far more likely it is that you're going to recover accounts. And I find that often you can get between 1 and 10 and 5% of accounts within a domain just using this technique. Of course, remember too that while I may not have gotten the administrator account, I probably don't need it because it's user accounts that give me access to the important data that's contained within our domain. Well, I hope you found this useful. And remember that in the show notes, I will post a link to that older blog article that discusses the seriousness of protecting user information.